Rosalie mentioned uh, that I have some Hadley roots going back to the 1660s. Three of my uh, ancestors were in the first settlers that came here. And so I have ancestors that were in the Alice family and the Warners and the Hubbards, are all kinfolk, but uh, they were restless people and they left the valley right after the revolution and uh, I'm the first one to come back. Uh, I moved here in, uh, 19, in 2011. And I, I like this area. So My wife's a Holyoke lady, so this was a natural return for her. On, on a visit uh, to my parents in 2009, uh, I brought along with me a digital video camera and I wanted to try it out. So I asked my dad if I could interview him about his wartime experiences. And he said, sure, he was 89 years old at the time. Um, I, I, he had been a writer and historian in his retirement and I knew a little bit about his experiences in the war, but he never really talked about it like a lot of those veterans. Uh, and listening to him for that 45 minutes that we talked, I realized that he had a very rich story to tell. And I suggested to him that uh, his six grandchildren might someday want to know the whole story. And uh, would he be willing to take the time to write it all down? He published five books about the history of Southside Virginia where I grew up um, and he agreed to do it if I promised that I would help edit the book and uh, help with the research and find a publisher. Uh, as we worked together in those last years of his long life, he died at 94 uh, in uh, 2013, it became for me the most meaningful time of our relationship. Now, my most important contribution to the book, really, was to reconnect my dad, Herman Melton, to shipmates. After the war, the men had scattered to the winds, and he had never again spoken with any of his shipmates from his years in the war uh, on any of the four ships on which he served. I tracked down eight men who were still living, uh, who had sailed with him, as well as the children of some veterans that he had, that had been his comrades who had passed away. And in letters and phone calls, they talked to my dad about their own memories of those times. And it was a very fulfilling part of the experience for him. Uh, and some shared some valuable photographs, and you're going to see some of them today. And these are a couple uh, that, that uh, came up. Uh, and uh, my father was an engineer, which they call them the Black Gang. They work down in the bowels of the ship, keeping the engines running. And uh, this fella here uh, had served with him on the engine gang. Uh, this man was, a, these two fellows were stewards, meaning they served meals to the officers. And my father was an engineering officer. And uh, I got to talk to both of these men and, and get to know them. Uh, and among those eight men, uh, uh, six of them have passed away since we got started, so I was very lucky to have made those connections. Professor Joshua Smith from my dad's alma mater, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, um, got interested in the project that's on Long Island, uh, uh, Kings Point, Long Island. He found a publisher for the book and he asked me to put together an exhibit about the story to be mounted in the American Merchant Marine Museum, which is on the campus of the Merchant Marine Academy. The professor loved the idea because although there are a number of books written about uh, the Merchant Marine, uh, there are very few first-hand accounts of engineers. Um, these men worked deep in the bowels of the ship and suffered appalling casualties during the war, uh, but they never talked about it they, after the war. They never wrote their stories down. The enemy submarines would always aim for the engine room because they know that they knew that they could cripple the vessel if they flooded uh, the engine compartment. Uh, and sadly, it was the engineer's duty to remain at their stations as long as possible, which is below the ship's waterline. Uh, they had to keep the steam up in the boilers in order to give 
the crew a fighting chance of survival. The book also highlights Herman's wartime romance with Helen Dunn, who became his wife and my mother. Uh, he always believed that his big break in life was his appointment to the Merchant Marine Academy, and uh, she truly helped to make it happen. Herman was born in Quail, Texas, very poor, in the Dust Bowl of North Texas. Uh, his father died when Herman was 10. Uh, at, as he finished high school, the family was broke and his future was bleak. His older sister, Billy, here on the left, uh, had married and moved to southwest Kansas. Uh, and the couple took Herman in and helped him find work so that he could enroll in the local junior college in Garden City, Kansas. He was the first in his family line ever to go to college. At the junior college, uh, in the weeks before Pearl Harbor, he met Helen Dunn, a bright young fellow student from that small Kansas town. And she's the one who's descended from the Hubbards and, and Scotts and Alice's from this part of the world. <clears throat> this is a poster, it was an advertisement in a magazine that she saw uh, in Look Magazine. And uh, uh, the draft board there in Garden City was already had their eye on my father. Um, and sh so when she saw this announcement of the opening of the new U.S. Merchant Marine Academy on Long Island, uh, she helped Herman to rush an application and he was accepted just as his draft order uh, came to report. Here he is as a plebe, as a, a first year cadet at Kings Point and that's the training ship there in the in the background uh, and uh, as I said it's called Kings Point named for the little village where it's located the Academy was built on the estate of Walter Chrysler the man who made the famous cars and he used to take his motor launch from from his dock into the Chrysler building in Manhattan to go to work so it was an easy way to commute <laughs> It's probably, Kings Point is probably the least well known of the service academies, there are, there are five of them. Uh, only the Air Force Academy is younger than Kings Point. But one of the distinctive features of the Merchant Marine Academy is that every cadet is expected to complete a sea project, meaning you go to sea after three years study and uh, get some training aboard ship. Uh, during wartime, this means that the Merchant Marine Academy is the only one of the service academies that sends their cadets uh, into combat. When Herman arrived at Kings Point, the nation was so desperate for ship officers, the full four-year college curriculum had been reduced to 18 months. So he was shipped out on his sea project six weeks after he arrived uh, uh, at the academy. This is his first ship, the Cornelius Harnett. It's a Liberty ship, uh, one of the early ones. And uh, he got on a train from Long Island and went down to Wilmington, North Carolina to board the ship. And it had just been launched, so they took it out on sea trials and put it through its paces. Uh, when he got there, he learned that it was bound for North Russia. Uh, wartime North Russia uh, in the bitterly cold winter of 1943. Now, in the months before Pearl Harbor, uh, or right after Pearl Harbor, but before we seriously became engaged in the war, President Roosevelt signed the Lend-Lease Act. Most of you have heard of that. And it was a way that we could get supplies to uh, the uh, British and the Russians as they tr uh, fought back against the, the German uh, onslaught. Uh, but they didn't have money, so we gave them the supplies, the armaments, uh, on, on loan uh, uh, with the expectation that it would be a long time before we got those dollars back. Um, and uh, at that point, Nazi Germany had already conquered Poland, France, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and the Soviet Union was Hitler's next target. The Russians 
were in dire need of tanks, airplanes, ammunition, rifles, medicine, food, everything, boots. Uh, but the only Russian harbor accessible from the Atlantic that is ice-free year-round is Murmansk. That's 200 miles above the Arctic Circle. Uh, the, uh, the, and the, the uh, Gulf Stream ends there. So it flows with warming water all the way to Murmansk, Russia, and then peters out. But that's what enabled it to stay, stay uh, ice-free during the winter. This is a convoy. Uh, by which uh, the, the ships would, would sail so that they could protect, uh, they could go under the protection of a Navy escort. Now, uh, not all of you may understand what is the Merchant Marine and what's the Merchant Navy. The Merchant Marine is a country's uh, shipping, uh, all of its ships that are used for commerce and industry. So even the, uh, the, the uh, uh, travel ships, the uh, liners that we sail on are part of our merchant marine. And in wartime, they could easily be um, drafted uh, for use of the, of the military service. And the merchant navy are all of those ships that get contract to the government to supply our troops to carry men uh, to, uh, to the battlefield. Uh, and the cargo ships uh, in the war sailed in convoys just like this one for protection against, against the, uh, the enemy. This is a merchant, uh, this is a uh, Liberty ship which was uh, the largest class of ships ever built. There were 2,700 of them uh, built during the war and no other class of ship in history has ever reached that number. Um, <clears throat> Our own, our merchant navy at the time the war began was very small, so the Liberty ship was, was uh, uh, created as a way to build them quickly and to build them all alike uh, so that they could be contracted to shipyards all over the country from Maine to Washington State. And uh, they were constructed of modular sections, meaning the the different parts of the ship were built and then they were brought to the, to the, sh the ship uh, uh, ways there and then welded together. In the past, ships had all been riveted together, but these were welds. So uh, in one public relations stunt, uh, a Liberty ship was assembled in four days. So that was, uh, that was pretty impressive. Now what was different about these ships? This was what was different for a merchant ship to have this kind of gunnery. Um, what you see there are uh, uh, guns that would fire uh, either a three or a five inch shell depending on which, which gun it is. And uh, uh, the ship would have one of these in the bow and in the stern and then they would have up to uh, eight or more of these 20 millimeter machine guns here you can see. And the Navy supplied the crews for these gunners, they were called armed guard, uh, so that they didn't have the Union seamen trying to figure out how to, to fire these kinds of, of guns. Herman's battle station for the voyage was to load shell magazines for the gunners and then run them to, to the gun crew. So it was like a powder monkey uh, in old days. This is the a map that will show you the Murmansk run, and they started here in Scotland. Loch U was uh, one of the main places where they would assemble the convoys, and then sail here. Here's the uh, the extent to which the German Luftwaffe could fly with their uh, torpedo bombers, and then up here is the extent of the Arctic ice. So you could not go out beyond the German range of their aircraft because you would come across uh, ice, uh, icebergs. And uh, this of course is January 1943, so the ice was pretty far south by then. At that time, Germany had invaded Norway and uh, conquered it basically, and they had built bases, air bases and submarine bases all along this coast uh, to prevent uh, the uh, supply of the Soviet Union uh, there in Murmansk. Churchill called 
the Murmansk run the worst voyage in the world. And I think he was probably right in those days. Uh, it was really a, a dangerous uh, passage for people. And uh, so they ran the a gauntlet of these dangers from the ice in the north to submarine U-boats and uh, torpedo bombers uh, uh, coming out of their air bases there in, in Norway. This man was in command of the convoy. He was a retired uh, British Navy Admiral and uh, uh, so he, he uh, tried to keep the ships together and uh, communicated with the Navy escort that went with them. Uh, and uh, he really wanted to be back in combat, but uh, uh, at his age he, he, had, he had moved beyond that. Uh, along with the um, merchant ships uh, were several tankers, so that if a ship's fuel got low, uh, they could fill them from, from this, this very ship. Uh, was in my dad's uh, convoy. Here's another ship that was in the convoy. That's a pretty seedy looking vessel. These were little trawlers that came along and they were used for rescue uh, for ships that uh, crew that were torpedoed. Uh, they had a low gunnel so they could get in down to the surface of the water and, and pull men out. Here's a British destroyer, Navy ship, that escorted uh, the convoy. There were several of them, in, including this one. This is the HMS Beagle, and it uh, sailed right with the convoy. And there were six of them uh, sailing with the convoy, and they would circle it because they were so much faster than those, those uh, uh, cargo ships. Uh, and uh, then there were other destroyers sometimes 100 miles away with what they called the, the ocean uh, escort, distant cover uh, of the convoy. And they would be um, protecting both the convoy on its way and returning from Murmansk at the same time. So that's why they were often so far away. And uh, this was the king of the of the escort. Uh, this is the King George the Sixth, which was the pride of the British home fleet at that point. And you can see she's been damaged in this photograph. And here she is in Norway. Uh, she had run into another vessel and was on her way back to be repaired when that photograph was taken. And this, of course, was the most powerful of all the, the ships in the escort. In all, there were 28 British naval vessels accompanying the convoy. There were 15 cargo ships and 28 Navy vessels. So that shows how important those supplies were uh, to the British Navy. This picture shows why the cargo was so precious. You can see here, these are aircraft. And uh, there are more back here, and there were also others in the hold. And this is a, a Liberty ship. Uh, and there, I counted 10 fighter planes on the deck and, there, and more in the holds below. Locomotives were critical to the Russians. They needed them to transport the ship's material by rail from Murmansk to the war front. And in my dad's convoy, uh, two ships were carrying locomotives so that at least one would get through. An artist that was traveling with the convoy drew this picture, so you can get an idea of the, the gloomy feeling uh, must have been sailing through those icy seas uh, as they neared the, the bleak Arctic port of Murmansk. Uh, the convoy's enemies were strong and many. And lurking in one of the Norwegian fjords was this pocket battleship, the most fearsome foe of the convoy. This is the, the Scharnhorst. Also, a wolf pack of U-boats stalked the convoy. This was one of the, one of the submarines that was uh, chasing them uh, just as soon as it entered the Arctic. But the first attack came from a flight of torpedo bombers like this unit. You can see there's a whole 
uh, squadron of torpedo bombers, and they were they were uh, float planes. Uh, you can see they got these floats so that they could land on the water, and uh, as they carried their bombs. These are Heinkels, Heinkel one one fives. As we as my dad and I did the research for the book, we were really excited to discover this photograph. Uh, it was in a, in a uh, U.S. Navy uh, archive. It had been captured after the war, uh, and it was mislabeled. And uh, I learned that from one of the Norwegian uh, people we worked with. Uh, uh, it said that it was from the, the that this was the port of Herkhanis, but it was really a, a port named Tromso, where they had a a seaplane base. And uh, Herman's convoy uh, was first spotted by a reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, and that's what this is. This is not a float plane. This is a flying boat. Uh, so this is what goes in the water, this fuselage here. And then there's some outlier floats. But this is a, a Blohm and Voss 138 German flying boat. You can see it being pulled out of the sea. Uh, but what uh, really excited us was that we were able to see clearly the aircraft numbers on this plane under a, under a magnifying glass. And uh, we were astonished to realize that this was one of the three bombers that attacked my dad's convoy. And I'll come back to that story. Here you can see one of the officers working to bring bring the ships in, bring the air, aircraft in. Here's a close-up of that plane, and it had a crew of three. Uh, there was a observer here who was the commander of the bomber, and here's the the pilot, and then there was also a a, uh, a gunner, and uh, it's at a dock here. Uh, these were fitted with, with steel skates under them so that they could land on icy uh, fields or frozen waterways. So here's what happened in, in, the, in the incident on January 24, 1943. They'd been at sea for seven days and the uh, observer plane, the reconnaissance plane, spotted them and notified uh, the bombers, and they they came in uh, from the rear. The, the convoy is moving this direction. You can see their destroyers circling uh, around it. These are Navy escorts uh, for the ships, and my dad's ship was right here, the Harnett. And uh, right about noon, three of the the Heinkel bombers came in uh, from the rear circled around and then attacked between these two uh, escort vessels. As the convoy moved ahead with the, with the destroyers and, and corvettes circling uh, for protection, uh, they came in from the rear so that they could avoid uh, the gunfire of, of the destroyers and uh, Drop torpedoes aimed at the at the uh, cargo vessels, and the gunners of my dad's ship uh, shot down one of the aircraft and set a second plane afire, uh, and that one later crashed. Uh, the third bomber was damaged. Here's the first one crashed, uh, and the second one crashed here, and then the third one was damaged and, and escaped. And this shows shows the action. You can see the, the torpedo bomber here. This is my dad's ship. And here's one one aircraft already in the water. And the cover of the book uh, shows another painting of this scene. The Luftwaffe kept good records uh, early in the war. So I was able to learn the identities of the airmen from the German Coastal Air Group 406 uh, who had attacked and, and uh, these men were the commanders of the two aircraft that were shot down. And uh, 
um, the two other crewmen in each plane uh, and these commanders died in the icy waters. This was their symbol, their emblem of the Kustenfliegergruppe 1, 4 und 6. So uh, that was the end of their lives. Uh, once in Murmansk, which is what you see here, here's the, the docks uh, in, in uh, the town. The convoy waited 36 days for the ships to be unloaded and right across the border in Finland was a German air base and so every day the, uh, the Stukas would, would come in to, and bomb the ships, sitting ducks uh, at the docks. Uh, the, the, um, the stevedores were not really stevedores, they were Russian political prisoners, slaves really, that were being used to unload these boats, so it was a very poorly run operation. And uh, my father never forgot how helpless and trapped uh, he felt during that long month. And, and you can see the Stuka bombers dropping uh, their, uh, their bombs here. Here's another intriguing photograph that we found. This one came from the Imperial War Museum in England. And this is my dad's convoy. And it's taken from the, the deck of this British destroyer here. And in the distance you see a uh, Liberty ship, and this was when they were assembling the convoy to head home. And uh, we, we wondered if this was his ship. Uh, be, you can see they're going home because the, the water line is way out of the water, uh, and it, it's not carrying much, much weight. Um, there was no worthwhile cargo in Murmansk to bring back. They would have wanted to have lumber or something uh, in the uh, holds so that the ship would ride, ride lower in the water. Uh, and this became a problem later on because uh, in the winds, in fierce gales, the ship blows around and is much more difficult to control. As they were leaving the Murmansk River, uh, an incident came up that uh, was very striking to my father and uh, he told this story very vividly. There was, they were attacked by German aircraft, and you can see the Stuka here, uh, but as they came over the ships, uh, the gunners on the Liberty ship started firing at the German aircraft. But what they didn't realize was that there was a Soviet uh, Air Cobra plane chasing the German aircraft and as they came by the ship the gunners on my dad's ship fired at it also and the commander of the gunnery went over and slapped one of the gunners and said I said cease fire damn it uh, but it was too late and they shot down uh, friendly fire uh, a Soviet airman uh, we, we were never, never able to find out who that was or uh, anything about that, that aircraft, but these were American planes made here uh, by Bell Corporation and shipped by another convoy uh, to Russia. And they love those, the Russians love those, those aircraft. So several days into the return voyage, um, Herman was out on the deck of his ship and one of the other young cadets said, look, porpoises. And uh, an old salt on deck said, those aren't porpoises, that's a torpedo. <laughs> and oh. so they crossed right in front of my dad's ship and exploded on the ship right next to them. And uh, he told stories about the men abandoning ship and how their equipment had been iced over and the, the uh, machinery that drops the boat in the water failed and the men were crushed against the ship and dropped into the water so it was a, a horrible experience. Uh, this is the U-boat commander that fired those torpedoes at his ship. Uh, again the records were quite good. 
Uh, and this was the emblem for the submarine uh, that stalked them uh, much of the way home. Uh, and he sank two of the ships, two of the 15 ships uh, in the convoy. Um, he would have probably sunk more except for the arrival of a violent Arctic gale uh, at that moment. And it scattered the ships of the convoy along with their attackers. And although the Harnet, Harnet was no longer at the mercy of U-255, that's the name of the U-boat, she was separated from the convoy and lost in the cold Arctic darkness. Uh, without the weight of the ballast, the cargo, uh, she was unable to make way in the storm. So through the long night they could hear explosions and even the radioed SOS of a sister ship that had been torpedoed. At one point the captain asked my dad, the young cadet, to go down into the engine room and take along a battle, bottle of brandy and uh, revive the spirits of the crew who were, as you can imagine, frightened to death. There they were lost and uh, uh, with U-boats all around them. At last the Harnett, well, here's, here's the U-255 uh, as she returned uh, from one of her hunts. This is Reshi, Reinhardt Reshi, the man in the previous picture, um, with his white gauntlets uh, as they sail in. Here's another U-boat in the harbor there in Norway as they come in to be honored for their success. At last, the uh, Harnett was uh, discovered by a Polish, free Polish destroyer, which had been assigned to the uh, British Navy because Poland had been uh, defeated and uh, they were basically exiles. Uh, and this man is Stanislaw Renecki, the commander of the um, the Polish uh, destroyer, and. Uh, his ship served as one of the escorts for the convoy, scouring the seas at that time, looking for the ships that had been scattered in the storm. Here's Renecki's ship, uh, ironically named the Orkan, which means hurricane. And uh, Herman was forever grateful to the Polish Navy for, uh, and this competent officer for the rescue of his ship after that storm. The Orkan led the Harnet to a rendezvous, rendezvous point in Iceland. And this is a photograph of the convoy, uh, um, RA-53. Uh, and there she rejoined the convoy uh, for the Atlantic crossing to New York. Uh, but sadly, five months later, Commander Renecki and the Orkan uh, were sunk by a uh, U-boat and uh, 163 of the sailors aboard and the commander went down, uh, never to be heard of again. It was dangerous business. This is the gunner who slapped, this is the gunnery commander who slapped uh, uh, the uh, man firing at the Russian vessel. Uh, I tracked down his family as well. He was dead by this point, but uh, my father admired him very much uh, uh, for his um, business-like uh, uh, action and for his courage and uh, he was Herman was pleased to learn that that uh, Richard Stone this man had been uh, awarded the silver star for his performance uh, on on that voyage and battling the, the Heinkel bombers and here he is getting uh, his medal so home from Russia in April 1943 my dad wasted no time to take a train to Kansas uh, to ask my mother to marry him, and here they are in their uh, engagement photograph. Uh, she agreed, but the academy said, no, you can't marry while you're a cadet. You're going to have to wait until you graduate. Um, so to be near him, uh, she enrolled at Adelphi College, which was about 10 miles away from the Merchant Marine Academy, and uh, uh, she transferred there from, from the junior college. Uh, while Herman completed uh, his uh, studies at, at the academy, and this is uh, Poseidon's wife, Amph uh, Amphitrite, uh, and uh, this was the good luck uh, statue, good luck fountain for the cadets. They would always come and throw coins in, in the fountain before exams. 
So he was commissioned an ensign. Here's his his class of engineers, uh, and they actually graduated on Valentine's Day. My mother had planned for them to be married on Valentine's Day, and she asked if maybe they could make an exception and she could they could wed on February 13. The academy said no, no way. So they were married the next day uh, in the academy chapel, and here's a scene with the saber ceremony. Uh, as uh, my dad's buddies uh, that he organized for that event. The next day they got on a train to go to California where he was had to report for duty uh, in the Pacific. Here's the ship that uh, he boarded in San Francisco. Uh, it's actually in New Guinea here taking on supplies and this is a photograph that he took of it. It's called the uh, SS Antoine Sagrain uh, and it was bound for New Guinea, where Douglas MacArthur was gathering forces for the return to the Philippines that uh, anyone who studied World War II uh, will remember. Uh, they, they started in Australia and went to New Guinea and had to recapture New Guinea from the Japanese who had, had uh, conquered it uh, early in the war. After Greenland, uh, New Guinea is the second largest island uh, in the world nearly 1,500 miles in length, and it was the launch pad for MacArthur's return to, to the Philippines. And here you can see all these bases along the coast. And so for the next uh, six months or so, Herman's ship uh, sailed back and forth to all these, these bases that we had built there to carry men and supplies uh, as they were getting ready for the October uh, invasion. Most of these bases had only recently been recaptured from the Japanese, and they were vicious fighting that went on to make that possible. Her, while, uh, as they got ready to go to the Philippines, Herman's ship began loading troops that were destined for the second wave of the invasion, which took place in October. And in November, he carried these men and, and other units uh, up to the Philippines. and. The 2773rd Engineers were advanced scouts for MacArthur, and they also were his PR unit. So he printed, uh, they printed maps and uh, also promotion. He was very much of a self-promoter, uh, Douglas MacArthur. And uh, you'll hear about this pooch in a minute. <coughs> Another unit they were carrying was the 237th Anti-Aircraft Artillery, and they used searchlights that were um, connected to guns uh, to shoot down aircraft, and they made use of some of the earliest radar, uh, the discs that were uh, invented during World War II. Here you see uh, soldiers of that unit, and uh, I found this man's uh, daughter and widow, uh, and got to know them, and, and got some of these photographs from them. Here we are on the, on the voyage to the Philippines and the trucks and other supplies for the different units and uh, you can see their insignia here on, on the boat. And uh, the men camped on the, on the deck because it was so hot in the tropics. In spite of the fierce rains that they had to endure, uh, it was better than going down into the holds of the ship. Six days after they launched, uh, left uh, New Guinea, uh, a Japanese bomb exploded off the bow of Dad's ship, and uh, it was the first of five attacks on the ship. Uh, just after noon, uh, two to torpedo bomber attacks uh, came back and hit the ship, and they crippled it. Uh, with all the steering and propulsion gone, uh, the captain ordered a abandoned ship. Um, and another uh, amazing find from the grandson of a soldier on board uh, was a photo of the ship dead in the water with men in life rafts. Uh, here you see it. My dad uh, got out on the other side of the ship, but here you can see the men on, on boats and there's some in a raft way off there, and then you can see these are individuals that just jumped in spite of sharks. 
Thanks to calm seas, though, the convoy's Navy escort vessels uh, rescued the men and brought them on deck the warships while a large ocean tugboat took the saw grain uh, under tow and they wanted to take it in to uh, be repaired because it had not sunk. Uh, but early the next morning, and here, here you see the, the actual rescue, and this was one of the photographs that came from uh, uh, the, the uh, grandson of, of one of my dad's shipmates, and these are Coast Guardmen on, on their vessel bringing in the, the men. The next morning, uh, the rescued seamen watched from the deck of the frigate that had rescued them as another Japanese bomber attack was driven off by the frigates around, here you see a frigate, uh, and a flight of American P-38s, this is an American aircraft, and they were uh, from the 7th Fighter Squadron of the 5th Air Force, and one of the Japanese bombers uh, was destroyed, uh, and this is a picture of, of these pilots, uh, uh, and uh, this is the fellow that shot down the Japanese aircraft. This was their mascot, their emblem, uh, the New Guinea Devil. Um, unfortunately, the American pilots were not on the scene when the final Japanese attack came later that day and sent the saw grain under the, wa under the waves. There was only one casualty of the sinking. Uh, this uh, Boston Terrier, uh, when, when the, the first torpedo hit, uh, she leapt out of the arms of one of the sailors and escaped below deck and could never be found. Uh, so they had to abandon the ship and, and she went down with it. Now with the loss of, of Herman's ship, he and his crewmates were marooned uh, in the Philippines on the island of Leyte, and the, a small band of them agreed to repair and return to service another Liberty ship that had been kamikaze uh, uh, in, in, near the harbor there, and this was right when the whole kamikaze uh, attacks began uh, during the uh, the, the Battle of the Philippines. But uh, it took him uh, four months to get that ship back to service and they sailed her home and uh, set sail to San Francisco where uh, his new ship could go into dry dock uh, uh, and uh, the major repairs that were really needed. And they arrived in America during the week that President Roosevelt died in Georgia. Uh, once they docked, uh, Herman rushed off the ship and called Helen. Uh, she boarded a train from Kansas the next day and sent this telegram. Uh, train late, meet me in Oakland if convenient. Love, Helen. Uh, although they could not afford dinner in this place, they celebrated the next night uh, in the ritzy starlight room, uh, or I guess the Persian room of, of the uh, San Francisco St. Francis Hotel. It's now called the Starlight Room. I think the hotel is still there. And the cigarette girl uh, took their photograph. So uh, while he was there in California, his family had moved from Texas to, to Santa Ana, California, and they had a joyful reunion. And uh, here is Billy, uh, his sister, who had taken him in, in in Kansas and it was always a real favorite of his. So during the following weeks Herman and Helen lived in Richmond, California near the shipyard where he was overseeing repairs to the SS William Sharon, his, his last ship. Then he was offered a post, his last Liberty ship, then he was offered a post teaching new engineer recruits on Santa Catalina Island which is 26 miles off Los Angeles. There's an old saying, when sailors die, they don't go to heaven, they go to Catalina. So it's a spectacular place if you've never been there. And Helen loved that assignment. And here she is, overlooking the harbor. Uh, there's the casino at Avalon in the distance. Uh, and they're up at the, um, the home of William Wrigley, the chewing gum manufacturer whose house was open to the public at that point. Um, 
Here is a ration book uh, from their days there, which I thought was a wonderful discovery that I made as we, we were digging into this. And um, uh, meanwhile, Herman served on his last ship, one last ship, a training vessel before his discharge from the Merchant Marine in 1946. But I once asked my dad uh, why he didn't enjoy sailing or never took an ocean cruise. He said, son, I had enough of the sea. <laughs> Uh, he spent his entire career on land in the natural gas pipeline industry, and Helen raised three boys and became an educator. Uh, then they spent the final two years of their careers teaching in North Africa and helping to manage the Algerian Petroleum Institute. And this is my favorite picture of them, uh, <coughs> taken on their uh, arrival home from Algeria in 1982. Yeah. Writers have called theirs the greatest generation, as you all know, because they endured the Depression, won the most destructive war in history, and built America into uh, the most successful economic power the world had ever known uh, during the second half of the 20th century. And the Liberty Ship had something to do with it, too. Herman was not alone in calling it uh, the ship that won the war. This table reminds us that America's most important role in the war was not our combat sacrifices. Other nations paid a much crueler price. Of the 21 million military casualties during the war, our losses were heartbreaking, but only a fraction of those of other nations. And you can see that among the Allies, 407,000 Americans lost their lives, but 3 million Chinese died and the USSR suffered most of all, 8.6 million dead. Uh, and from the Axis powers, 300,000 in Italy, 2.1 million in Japan, and 4.0 million Germans. No, it, it, it was not the size of, of our dead, but rather, I believe it was the technological and industrial might of the US that was our greatest contribution to the final victory in 1945. And the Liberty Ship was crucial in delivering the products of that agricultural and industrial might to the battlefields, uh, as well as to the home fronts of our allied nations. So it was more than a goodwill gesture that my dad was invited in 1992 to the Russian Embassy in Washington, D.C. to receive the Jubilee Medal marking the 50th anniversary of what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War. They honored the service of British and American sailors aboard the Arctic convoys to Russia during the darkest days after the German invasion of the Soviet Union. You still have a month if you want to learn more about this story. Uh, you can visit the Liberties War exhibit at the American Merchant Marine Museum. And here's a scene from the exhibit, but it comes down uh, in the end of June. Uh, I also have copies of Herman's book. Some of you have already bought them. Uh, uh, it's discounted to $20 tonight, this afternoon, and appreciation for your coming today. And I'll be happy to sign one uh, for anyone uh, who's interested. Acta non verba, the motto of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Words. Action, not words. That's right. I'd like to thank uh, Rosalie and Al Weinberg for helping me to set up uh, for this session uh, and uh, for those of you who invited me and to the Historical Society for being my host. So thank you very much for coming. I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, like, your dad looked like he was a pretty tall and lanky guy all his life, but yep. I had to get a laugh out of that card that said, 5'11", 151 pounds when he was in the war. <laughs> that's pretty slim. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. He left all of the, the mementos that you saw photographs of and some others as well to my, my son who was interested in World War II. So uh, he's going to pick them up from the museum and uh, keep them. Yes? So is he a military veteran? That's an interesting story. Uh, when the, the Merchant Marine Academy uh, was set up to train officers 
for the merchant navy. And the men, the sailors, the seamen were um, uh, Union hands. Uh, and, uh, but my dad, although he, he may have joined the, uh, the Engineers Union, he was offered a commission in the U.S. Navy Reserve and the U.S. Merchant Marine uh, when he graduated. And he was grateful for uh, the opportunity to study there, and so he went into the Merchant Marine. Uh, but when the war was over, uh, little did he know, um, Roosevelt signed the, um, the GI Bill. Uh, it was one of the last bills that he signed. And at, at the time that he signed that act, he said, I only have one trouble with this, and that is that the Merchant Marine is excluded. I hope that that will be fixed soon. And he died, and it never was fixed. And so uh, the veterans, of the Merchant Marine who had seen much more combat than men who might have been behind a desk in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, got no benefits. So my dad was considered a, a Merchant Marine uh, veteran and he came out and there was no GI Bill for him. There was no opportunity for, you know, re for tuition, free tuition or low, low lo uh, loans for housing or the other benefits that came from the GI Bill. So he was on his own. And they fought for the next 40 years to change that. And Bob Dole, bless his soul, uh, was a major leader in that effort. And it finally happened in 1985. Uh, and today, merchant seamen are not considered veterans unless they were in the, uh, in the war from 1941 to 1945. But still, by then, my dad had no need of the GI Bill. There was also a move to try and uh, award the veterans who had failed to receive benefits uh, a one-time cash award, but it never happened. And the, they're dying more and more every day. There aren't many left, really. So. My husband had a cousin that went in the uh, Merchant Marines when he was only 14. Hmm. He was a big fella. And, and, uh, when he, I think he was in for four years, and he was in the in the uh, active areas. Yeah. And when he got out of the Merchant Marines, he wasn't considered in the, a veteran, so they he was uh, drafted into oh, the. Wow. And spent uh, many years. He was uh, in the Vietnam Vietnam War, and a, a tragic thing happened to him. He was. Um, he, he was a very good sergeant, and so they put him in charge of a battalion that, or uh, to help this captain with uh, disgruntled Americans that were in this. And he and the captain were sharing a tent, and one of the men lobbed a grenade in the uh, tent, and uh, it didn't kill him, but he was in the hospital for months and months and months. Um, and, and when he came out, uh, he was, you know, ready to serve again, mm -hmm. but he couldn't stand the cold, and they were going to ship him up to Iceland, and that's when he got out of the service. <laughs> <laughs> the stories are amazing. Yes. How many trips did your dad make on that Russian route? Was it just one? Just one. And that was plenty for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took uh, about four months mm -hmm. in all, from beginning to end, and they started in. Wilmington and gathered with one convoy in New York and sailed to Scotland and then they were made up into a different convoy that sailed uh, to Murmansk and then a, a third, an, another convoy gathered for the return voyage from Murmansk, ships that had been trapped there in Murmansk and came back and then they got into the, uh, the Atlantic convoys that sailed from England to America. So We have very good records of all the ships that were on those convoys and some men uh, who have done a lot to preserve that information. So I had a lot to work with. Sure. The um, German records, did you find those online or did you go to Germany? I, I communicated with people in, in Norway uh -huh. primarily, but also many of them were available online. Okay, military records are increasingly available mm -hmm. over the internet.
Did yes. you find them in Fold 3? Like, which uh, database did you find them? I use that a lot. Okay. I sure did. Okay. I still subscribe to it. I don't know if you all know about that, but it's an Ancestry.com service that has the service records of millions of American veterans. Mm -hmm. Yes? It's my understanding that in the beginning of the war, the Merchant Marine did not have convoys to protect them, and they, they suffered a serious, serious amount of loss of life. Is that true? Uh, there, the convoy was a new idea. It start, yeah. started in World War I, but uh, it took them a while to get it uh, uh, well organized. But the, the earliest um, uh, shipments usually went by convoy. And they had convoys that sailed all over the world, really, and they, they had different letters that indicated where they were going and where they were, their, their origin was. But uh, uh, the, the big uh, problem was the escorts. That's what the I protection. meant to say with the actual protection. So they, that's right. That's In the beginning right. they, they didn't know what they would need for uh, escort duty and uh, so there were horrific casualties. Uh, uh, and in, in one particular case, in the summer of 1942, um, only a third of the ships returned. So that was a notorious example. And it was partly because the British Navy uh, officers, commanders in that convoy, got spooked. Uh, they heard that uh, big surface ships were coming and they told the convoy to scatter. And so the Germans just picked them off one by one, uh, and uh, very few made it through. Who painted the pictures? What's that? Who painted the pictures? Uh, there, uh, we found this fellow in Scotland who is a naval uh, veteran, British Navy veteran. He was in both the British Merchant Marine and the British Navy, and had sailed on one of the ships that, one of the aircraft carriers that had done the convoy duty. And, uh, we enlisted him to paint them, and he did the, uh, I think, six different pictures, and he did a big oil painting as well that's on the cover, and uh, uh, I, I gave one to each of my sons. Oh, so, nice. Yes? In your research, did you encounter the Liberty ships that were made out of concrete? I don't remember uh, anything about that, to be honest. So. Uh, um, I have not heard that. I would be surprised, though. They were trying all different kinds of things. Was a Sharon yes. horse built in Norway? They took German, the big German No, it was ship. built in, in um, one of the major German shipyards. That, was that the sister ship for the Bismarck? Uh, I believe the Bismarck was a uh, battleship, a yeah. grand battleship. This yeah. was a pocket battleship, so they were a little smaller. Thanks a lot, bro. Thank you. Thank you very much.